Hello everyone, this is John from RPGs and More, and in today's video, I want to talk to you about weapons in our OSR or Dungeons and Dragons style games. And there's one thing about weapons that I find really kind of fascinating and maybe a bit frustrating at times. Uh, starting with uh, earlier editions of D&D, but especially the, when my experience of this started really with uh, 3.0 and 3.5, we began to really classify our weapons by the type of damage that they did. I know this, this kind of happened in 2nd edition a lot too. Um, I didn't have as much experience with 2nd edition, so I, I can't talk to how that worked. But I know that with uh, 3.5 and 3.0, uh, like slashing weapons would deal more damage to things like gelatinous cubes, whereas uh, like piercing weapons would do less. And uh, a, a zombie would, you know, take less damage from a bludgeoning weapon and more damage. from It, it kind of got all, all mixed up. But one of the things that this tended to do is it tried to encourage players to carry a wide variety of weapons on them. So you would get a player wanting to carry, say, a, a long sword, or what we would refer to as an arming sword, in addition to a mace. And then they'd also want to have a, like a crossbow for ranged combat, or a short bow if they were wanted to carry a bow instead of a crossbow. Um, and it's, there, there's a lot of information out about, like, loadouts and what actually you physically could carry and, and frankly a lot of what we ended up putting on our characters was pretty darn impractical uh, when you think about what weight a human being can carry for long periods of time both while traveling through wilderness while uh, trudging through a very close enclosed space and while uh, fighting various sized monsters so i want to talk to talk about those kind of things touching briefly on a few, couple different topics within this wider uh, topic of just weapons. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is that that kind of weapon type, uh, how, you know, we would tend to classify a weapon as a slashing weapon or a piercing weapon or a bludgeoning weapon, and that's it. Uh, and I think that this is wrong. I think this is not really a way to, a way that we should think about this because Let's uh, let's take the classic example of the long sword, oh, uh, and this is actually more representative of what a long sword might have been because the hilt is long enough, or that a hand and a half can fit on it. Now, the long sword is made. Let's kind of see how, I, how I hold, I'm holding it here. Now, it's made so that I could uh, hold it in one hand, in this case, or two hands, and then slash at my opponent with it. But here's the thing. like That's how we use it. That's how that we, we tend to describe, oh, I slash. I slash. I slash at my opponent. I'm, I'm cutting at their, at their thigh. I'm cutting at you know, their head. I'm, I'm, or you know, I come up to guard, and I'm guarding. You know, I'm really, I'm not, I know I'm not holding it right, but I'm, I'm not claiming to be a member of HEMA or anything. I'm just a guy who's a fan. So um, it's all fun and games right now. But anyway, so the idea here is that we tend to focus on the blade. We focus on the blade itself of the sword and on the slashing part. And that's what the game focused on. But here's the deal. Long swords, or, and most, almost any kind of sword also were... Like if you half sword it, that's a piercing weapon. Whack! Right there. I am going to try to pierce through the armor in order to uh, get, you know, to break the chain links in that, that guy's chainmail armor with the point of my sword and just pierce the gambus in. And I'm just going to keep on doing that. Or I'm going to try to thrust into that, that slit in your helmet and get my, the tip of my sword directly into your face. Uh, it was definitely capable of being a piercing weapon. In fact, it was designed to do that. I've been looking at these sketches. I'll show you a book right now. I'm reading and looking at the sketches by uh, Tal Hoffa, and it actually has several diagrams or several sketches that demonstrate these techniques, that demonstrate the necessity of holding a sword like this 
two thrust to they call it an armor piercing strike where you're putting as much strength and force as you can into the point of the weapon in order to pierce the armor the other thing uh, so a sword is a slashing weapon it's also a piercing weapon but it's also a bludgeoning weapon because they also talk about gripping the sword one hand here another hand here at the at the end so you got both hands are on the blade but then you're using the hilt especially the pommel and the krillians or cross guard of the weapon as a bludgeoning device you're going to attempt to smash someone in the face with the pommel or in the knee take out their kneecap especially if they're not wearing armor and these are all techniques that again are in the the drawings <laughs> the drawings that come to us from the medieval era from the 14th and 15th century these things are real these are actual techniques that were taught to people fighting with these weapons and so i think that we ignore them at our peril and but not i guess peril isn't the right term we, we ignore them at the risk of our fun because wouldn't it isn't it much more entertaining than saying well I take my sword and I slash and then I slash again and I'm slashing again. Ha ha, aren't I a Hollywood hero? And you're like, no, okay, I take my sword. I'm holding it in a high, uh, you know, a higher grip, but there's gonna be higher than this. I'm gonna thrust and then I'm going to turn and I'm going to slash at their, at their neck as I'm pulling back, even though my first attack missed. And then I'm gonna grab the, my blade turn it around, grip it again, and I'm going to try to jam the pommel directly into their nose to try to break their nose. That doesn't work. I bring it back, switch my grip again, extend my grip down, and now I'm going to use the quellians of my sword to hook behind their leg and yank their leg out from underneath them, a trip attack. And if that doesn't work, then I'm going to bring the sword up again once more and hook it around their sword blade and try to yank their sword or axe out of their hands towards me to bring it out of the way so that once it's done i can then quickly reverse once more and slash with the tip of my sword so slashing piercing and bludgeoning all in one weapon that's one of the reasons why swords, especially the long sword variety, were an effective sidearm for most people for hundreds of years. They really kind of did a lot of what was required. So there's one, one thing here. I really just I don't think that classifying weapons as only slashing or piercing or bludgeoning is really uh, does, does us any, any good, really. I think it, it ignores the majority of the weapon, and it's something that we should we should not necessarily necessarily keep doing uh, for future editions of the game. I'm really hoping that if they're going to keep this with D and D when they do uh, like you know uh, 5.5 in, in a couple of years, I really hope that they start you know broadening this out a little bit. Oh, things are falling over. The other way that I want to kind of illustrate this, it's not just swords. Take the hand axe, or in this case, it'd be one-handed battle axe. Uh, typically, these, these things had one of two things going on. Either the other side would have a flat end, kind of like a hammer, that you could turn and use to jam or to try to smack somebody on the top of the helmet, or you could use it like you would a mace against their chainmail armor. And a bludgeoning attack against chainmail armor is incredibly effective because the chainmail will protect you from the slashing damage, but it won't protect you from your arm getting broken by the sheer force of this thing coming down on you if you fail to get your shield up in time. The other thing is that the, the kind of bearded part of this axe can be used, get a, a buckler in case, can be used to hook and pull the shield out of the way. So I would actually like to see in rules and games more of that sort of thing where I can use the hook of my weapon 
to remove the shield of my opponent so that they cannot use that shield in the next round. The shield is now like rendered ineffective because it's been yanked out of position. I'd like to see that as, as an option. We like to see, or there's the also the piercing side. So some, some axes had a, axes made for war also had a kind of a pick on the other end and being able to use that to cause piercing damage against your opponent. I'll sometimes refer to it as the can opener. So these, these are, that's another way where these techniques can be used. These weapons can be used in non-standard ways. So that's, those are two strong arguments. Those are two strong arguments that I make as to why trying to classify a weapon as only slashing or only bludgeoning or only piercing doesn't really work. Even the spear, that, that spear that everyone assumes is just like only piercing because you're just, ah, you're thrusting it. Well, that's not really true because uh, many, several cultures, including the Normans, had what we called hewing spears. And these were spears with long bladed spear tips that were designed to be used to cut and slash at your opponent at a distance. And that's why you would get these huge, long, leaf-shaped spearheads. They weren't all there just to, I mean, they helped with the thrust, but they weren't there only for the thrust. They were sharpened on the sides because they expected the users to be trying to use them to slice at each other along the way. I, I've actually tried fighting with a spear in a foam fighting group in the past, and it was fascinating. It was probably my favorite way of trying to fight out of everything. And I thought I was going to be obsessed with the sword because I've always been, but actually using a spear and figuring out how to get you know, past your opponent's guard with that kind of weapon was one of the more interesting aspects of that kind of fighting. So, so that was the main thing. Now, here's the other thing. Another... Um, Two weapon fighting. All too often, I see people talking about two weapon fighting and what they end up, what they end up trying to showcase is someone who's got a sword in one hand, you know, another weapon in the other. I'm, uh, my, let's see, where'd the ax go? There it is. Okay, sword in one hand, ax in the other, whatnot. And they're like, well, I'm just going to like keep going on and doing all these things. Rah, 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 rah. Okay. Um, if you were really, really good, you might be doing that. Um, I'm, you know, and some people are really, really good, but I would imagine that the vast majority, especially in low levels of adventures really wouldn't be doing that. They would be doing what was done historically. And historically, when you're looking at two weapon fighting, what you're looking at You've got the dagger in one hand and the sword in the other. And what that is there for, it's not to give you two attacks necessarily. I mean, it gives you the option if one is bound by your opponent and uh, it can't move, like they've grabbed the sword blade, you still got the dagger to come in around and uh, try to get at your opponent from another angle, or you can feint with one to thrust with the other. But the other thing that this does is the dagger often can become an effective defensive tool, just like you would use a buckler in that combat. So you're using the dagger to help deflect. You kind of thrust it forward and move it only slightly, and it will deflect a thrust as the thrust, as the sword is sliding up along the dagger's blade. So you can just thrust that their opponent out of the way while bringing your sword up underneath, and then you come through with your own thrust at just as they're closing in close to you to finish their own attack, which you've already blocked across. So uh, I actually am more of a proponent of two-weapon fighting being a, a bonus to defense or a bonus to attack depending on how you're using it. So in the OSR terms, I would say that it's 1d6 damage, or it can be 1d6 plus 1 to damage for a two-weapon attack, or you can choose to have it just do 1d6 damage, but then have a plus 1 to your armor class for that round. And then you pick round by round which one you're doing to, to kind of just show off 
which area you're focusing your dagger on while you're fighting. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. But that actually brings me to the next point. We tend for a long time, ever since the Greyhawk supplement in OD&D, there have been variable dice for weapons. Uh, daggers do a d4. Short swords do a d6. Uh, uh, long swords or arming swords do a d8. And then uh, the bigger swords, sometimes they, they were d10s. Sometimes they were d, you know, two, uh, two d6s. It, it, d12s were big axes. You know, it kind of it varied a little bit. But it's been pretty consistent in the concept ever since uh, those days. I don't remember what year that was exactly. I don't think it was 1974, but it was pretty early on. And I, I can see why that's that's popular because a lot of people were like, oh man, I really just want to, I, I want, I, I'm wielding that great sword. And so how can I make a mess? How can I be wielding this huge great sword and have it the same da the same potential damage as my lighter sword how can that work why why is there a, why is that happening and and so it becomes popular to to grab the biggest weapon that you can to deal the most damage that you can in any given situation especially once you've got like you know 2d6 on a great sword and you're not worried about carrying a shield because you're already wearing pretty heavy armor the way it actually worked in history, uh, once knights started wearing heavier plated armor and coats of plates, shields started going a little more, they became smaller, and then later they started going out of fashion in preference for larger two-handed weapons or pole axes, which I do not have an example of with me here today. And and because and, and so that, that makes a certain amount of sense. You want to have a longer a longer weapon. To, in order to get a range advantage on, on your opponent. But what I'm going to talk about is one thing that I really like about the older versions of the OSR games. And, and I came to this later in, in life. I, I did not have that nostalgia. I, I joined this group, you know, this, this mindset a much later. And it's for one specific reason. It's because when uh, in, those, in some of those early games, especially Swords and Wizardry Light, all weapons do 1d6 damage. Doesn't matter the type. Doesn't matter anything. It's all 1d6 damage. If it's a large two-handed weapon, the damage is 1d6 plus 1. If it's a very small weapon like a dagger, you do 1d6 minus 1 damage with a minimum of 1 on the roll. And I think that this is a superior way to do it. And I think that for one primary reason. When you are a skilled combatant, when you know what you're doing with your weapon, it doesn't matter if that weapon is a great sword or a hatchet or a dagger. You are dangerous with that weapon because you know what you're doing. And that weapon is going to, if it hits your opponent, it's going to do damage. The idea that a the damage from a great sword should inherently be just exponentially larger than what a dagger can do, I, I don't like that at all. I, I don't think it's... I don't think it is uh, appropriate because there's a lot of work that daggers did on medieval battlefields that the great swords couldn't do because the great swords were focused on, uh, you know, cutting cutting through the pikes or getting getting you know through the the big formations. But it was the daggers that would get through the armor to per, per, uh, deliver the murder stroke to the enemy and kill them if you weren't trying to capture them with their ransom money. So. I like the idea of every weapon doing 1d6 damage because it equalizes the weapons and instead it emphasizes the story of the character who is carrying those weapons. So yes, there are people who say, well, if that's the case, then why wouldn't I, why would I carry anything except daggers? If that's the character you're creating, go for it. You are empowered to do that. You want to be the guy that has a bandolier of daggers and you're just like, you're just grabbing them and throwing them. That's fine if that's your your goal but if you want to be like the village guard that has their spear and their shield and maybe a, a club and that's your jam you're empowered by this because in the past that spear 
was rendered a simple weapon. And so it always did less damage. It had fewer like special quirky rules about it, even though spears were, were some of the most versatile and useful weapons throughout ancient to medieval history. And it's one of the things that is still used by cultures in some places to this day. Uh, this spear or its descendants were act have actually been used all the way up to World War II because I consider a bayonet mounted on the end of a rifle to be in the family of the spear because it ends up being a long blade at the end of what is essentially a wooden pole. And that's why uh, the spear has been useful for that amount of time because it's a way of reaching out and stabbing somebody from a further distance away. You can do it effectively. You can train for it well. It's, it can do the stabbing and the slashing because that's what we, we discovered and we realized. And so a spear has been one of the most consistent weapons of humanity since the Stone Age. But in role-playing games, when's the last time you started your character and said, you know what, I'm going to pick a spear? I'll, I'll wait. Go ahead. Think about it. No, you're, you're probably like me. For the most part, you don't grab the spear because the spear is not an effective weapon according to the rules. The rules emphasize like the great sword or the long sword or the, the great axe or the, all these other weapons that deal this big damage, whereas the spear is stuck with a D8 or sometimes even just a D6 because they want to keep it as like that weapon for the town militia kind of thing. And it's actually this really awesome thing. But outside of the OSR style games that where weapons only deal like 1d6 damage, all weapons, you're not going to see them. But if you're playing with those older games where all weapons deal 1d6 damage, suddenly that spear is just as effective in melee combat, just as damage dealing as that arming sword. And your character has a reason to carry one because not only is it an effective stabbing weapon or a thrusting weapon, but it can also be thrown. It can be used from horseback you know, couched like a, an early form of the Norman lance, you the spear is incredibly versatile and it comes into its own in this kind of scenario. And so do so many other weapons. The creativity opens up. Suddenly not everyone is carrying the same group of weapons. You can carry anything you want. You want to have an atlatl? You can do that. You want to run, be running around with like two clubs? You're golden. You want to grab you know, a crossbow that shoots daggers. Well, if your DM's going to allow it, go for it because the the rules aren't that important. They're not going to stop you from creating that creative idea that you want to have and then running with it. And that's, it's, it's amazing. And it's great. It's a great thing. And I wish that we would see more of that with more, uh, you know, systems that are coming out now, especially with the later editions of D&D, &D, because it makes characters better it makes choices necessary it makes people empowered to make choices on for reasons that aren't necessarily like well, this is the most effective weapon according to the rules uh it's more like this is the most effective weapon because this is awesome and this is what i want to use and that's what these games should be about it should be about us telling the kind of stories and being the uh, the awesome heroes that we want to be and not about you know, memorizing a rule book and saying, well, the rules say that this is the best thing. And so this is what I'm going to do. And then suddenly all your fighters look the same because everyone uses the same combination of things because that's kind of what works for them. And, and it's gets really freaking boring as far as I'm concerned. This is my opinion. These are, this is all my opinion. You can disagree with me all you want. Anyway, so that's kind of my little, my little, uh, Ted talk, if you will. Thank you for joining me, uh, about, uh, weapons and their use in uh, D, D games i think that we should be spending more time on on being more descriptive with our weapon attacks and maybe utilizing some more rules with these weapons attacks i think that future games should take this sort of stuff into account and make it easier for fighters to do cool stuff instead of making it so the most effective thing a fighter can do is i slash my sword i slash my sword i slash my sword because that's like the most effective thing for them to do in order to actually win the game. No, I want the fighters to be like, I'm going to disarm the opponent. I'm going to trip the opponent. I am going to 
<laughs> try to bind their weapon and twist away and keep it for myself and take it from them and then use it back on them again. You know, have all these kind of crazy stunts that they can do with their weapons and make their fights look like they come, they're straight from an Errol Flynn movie. That would be amazing. Please. Wizards of the Coast. Uh, Frog God Games. Anybody. Anyone who's listening, you know, like, this is the kind of stuff that we want. This is this is what or I want. This is what I want. Um, I think it would be great. So thank you so much for joining me today. I hope that you enjoyed this content. If you enjoy content like this, please leave a comment down below. Maybe give the video a thumbs up and subscribe for more. I, I do videos where I comment on role playing games and I hope to continue to do so. Um, um, I do want to have something uh, coming up with terrain. I've got to spend some time kind of building a few pieces because uh, I have a day job and it kind of takes up a lot of time right now. Uh, but anyway, uh, so terrain's coming up, more role-playing game reviews and recommendations are coming up, and I've got more solo sessions of Nave coming up. I want to kind of finish that story before I move on to the next system that I'm going to do. Not sure what that will be. If you've stayed in the video this long, I encourage you to let me know, is there one of the systems that I have done before, that I've done a video about, that you would like me to see, see me do a solo, a solo session? Right now, the leading contenders would be more Swords and Wizardry Continual Light. I could do a solo of that. Or I could do a solo of um, Tiny Dungeons. I wouldn't mind doing that if that's what people are interested. Or I could do a short solo uh, session group of a different system that you have seen me talk about and would be interested in seeing. Uh, Cypher system is another one. I could uh, pick up that one if people are really interested in that. Let me know in the comments down below. Again, thank you so much. I hope you have a wonderful day. Peace be with you. Bye-bye.